Hello, welcome to the Reasons for the Hope podcast out of St. Peter's, Missouri. Today the team will be discussing the final episode of our series on critical race theory and if it is compatible with Christianity. Hey Addison, so we moved on from the previous episode uh, in regards to uh, what was critical race theory's claims? You know, we talked about the issue of what do they say, what do they have to say about racism, intersectionality, hegemonic power, what do they think, you know, uh, life experiences provide, the, the issue of oppression, the duties, and how they identify. So there were a lot of tenets, major things that uh, a lot of critical race theory. Um, I mean, people that support the movement, you know, uh, take into account, even though they may not have a particular definition of the movement. So today, uh, or I, I should say in this episode, we are going to contrast this with Christianity. And I wanted to, you know, flat out and say something very important whenever we talk about Christianity and, and the issue of race. The language of scripture, I have um, this very thick book, uh, I guess they call it the Concordance. It's, uh, it's, basically, <laughs> it's basically a huge, uh, not dictionary, but a word bank, uh, many words. Um, and when I looked at the word race in there, I was surprised to see that most of the time, would Bible when the Bible uses that word, it refers to you know a race of people running, <laughs> not, a foot not race. Ne- right, <laughs> a foot race. Not necessarily what the concept that we're handling in here, uh, or that has been used in the past. And and you know, I was just interesting because the the word that is mostly used uh, on scripture to you know talk about people and perhaps where they come from, how they look, and so forth. It's well the word people. Uh, and, and it uses that word to identify, you know, groups, cultures, societies, what they believe, their actions, and even character sometimes. Um, the concept of race that we, uh, that we currently have, which is highly oriented, uh, oriented, I should say, to the pigmentation of your skin, is not the same concept that the scripture use. But I thought that this is perhaps um, a good thing in, in, in the sense that it's not that we cannot talk about race then because it doesn't mention the actual war in the way that we're handling it now, but because scripture is trying to say that we're all, all of us are children of God, you know, one race, the human race, regardless of the concept that we use uh, as a modern man to refer to grace, you know, the taxonomy and all that other stuff that comes with it, or etymology of the word. Uh, but the human race, we're all children of God. And, and, and you know, the few of the scriptures that I pulled up to, to talk about each of these points uh, that contrast with critical race theory. So we have, for instance, in 1 Peter 2, 9, it says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellences of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we also have in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verse 13, it says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. And you can tell just in this language the unity that the new testament and 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 uh the the apostles are bringing to us the unity of bringing the people everyone regardless of their pigmentation how they look any of that stuff age culture doesn't matter everyone is welcome and that to me is such a startling contrast from what critical race theory has to say Anything about that 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 you may have? Well, I was thinking of uh, the Good Samaritan, the parable Mm -hmm. of the Good Samaritan. Well, the you know the man the man is beset by robbers and he's beaten up, all his stuff is stolen, you know, and he gets passed by all by all these people that should have helped him, 
They should have been the good people to help him. And this wasn't just a parable based on uh, people's moral bends and, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatnot. It was saying that this person that you despised, this person that you think is bad, this person that culturally uh, was was at odds with you um, has stopped to help one of you, you know, and, and uh, there was no hesitation from him. And right. that, that's, that's, you know, part of the, uh, I keep ragging on this, but I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. It's part of being an individual. It's part of proof yes. that we're individuals. You can be different from what the stereotypes of whatever a group people want to put you in, you know, say mm -hmm. that you are. That's right. You know, Neil Shenby, as we were talking about, the Christian apologist done a lot of research on this. Um, you know, the, the, the example that you were talking about, the Good Samaritan, you know, having compassion. There was a, an, another scripture with, which ties with the concept of intersectionality, because when I looked that up, surprise, surprise, surprise that, that word has never been used in scripture. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's not, it's, we're not going to find it that way. We'll have to look at examples and see if we see something akin to that, right? And um, Neil Shanby, uh, I'll just read out what he says here, because I, I, I think he puts it so well. I don't, I don't want to take away from his research either. Uh, he says, the Bible doesn't use the term intersectionality, but the concept of overlapping discriminations was present in ancient societies, just as it is today. And examples of it can be found in the Bible. The woman at the well who encountered Jesus in John 4 was the victim of different forms of discrimination. First, she was a woman, and rabbis typically did not speak publicly to women. Second, she was a Samaritan, and there was great hatred between the Samaritans and the Jews, who considered them idolatrous, half-breeds. When Jesus asked her to give him water from the well, she was shocked. How is it, she asked, did you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? And uh, third, she was a social outcast because of her lifestyle in the past. Drawing water from a community well was a form of social interaction for people and usually occurred during the early part of the day. The Samaritan woman came to the well at the sixth hour uh, or noon when she knew others would not be present. She was shunned in her own town because she was living with a man who was not her husband and had been doing so with other men. And I thought, wow, you know, there is intersectionality right there. All kinds of issues, you know, women, you know, the, the, she's not from around here. The only thing that was probably missing there, it's like, hey, this lady is actually, uh, you know, dark. She's black. <laughs> she's not, uh, I don't know what colors were they, uh, they had mostly then. But I mean, this is, this is um, in Israel. So, I mean, they're close to Egypt and, and, and. And they're close to Asia as well. So, I mean, who knows how people look? I don't know. I've never Probably done research on that. Dark, <laughs> it, it, olive skin, dark hair, dark eyes. Right. So, well, so there's that. And, and, uh, and the startling contrast, um, uh, you know, in, in Scripture says, the woman uh, said to him, I know the Messiah is coming when that one comes he will declare all things to us and and i thought that you know for the issue of intersectionality to end uh as to contrast it with christianity christianity is telling you just how jesus said to her you know i am he the one speaking to you know the messiah i come here to declare all these things to make things new and 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 to restore relationships and to bring people back to the father to you know um you know scripture does say that <laughs> this is funny because sometimes you, you can find scripture that goes against what you're trying to say for instance you know jesus has said that he wants to put you know brother against brother father against father but clearly when people uh quote out of context then the message is lost and um, and in this case, what Christ is talking about, what Jesus is talking about, is that he's unifying humankind. 
because he's been separated from God. And 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 it's not using all these different uh, issues that, that people may have, whether you are of a different color, different age, and, and all these things that, that the woman at the well had, and, and saying, well, just because you were Samaritan now, you cannot you know, partake of this. No, he's saying, regardless of all these things, you can come here. You can come here and and I will make you new. I will make you part of this family. Very big difference with what critical race theory shows of um, or tries to, tries to teach there. I know earlier you, you started with uh, hegemonic power on the previous episode. Do you have anything in the Christianity has as a contrast on that matter? Um. I not with hegemonic power like specifically, but this concept huh? of it's essentially like peer pressure. I mean, it's yeah. it's like a a heavy peer pressure from the people that are in power, essentially. And I don't have much of an issue even with the idea of hegemonic power as a concept. I mm-hmm. think it makes a lot of sense that your society and the people that are in power influence the people that are in your society and then are not in power. I mean, that's not really something I'm <laughs> confused well, by, you know? Let, yeah. But I, I, I think I would say that uh, it's actually something that, historically speaking, uh, Christians are quite familiar with um, because there has been so much intense persecution of Christianity since its birth. I, I made this post on Facebook, and, and I want to make the exception that Christians in the United States, and I should say in first world countries, really haven't experienced much in the way of persecution to the degree, historically, mm. that Christianity is familiar with. Yeah, very so, important. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm not saying that a lot of Christians in these first world countries understand the pressure of uh, of a society that is really, really anti-gospel. But mm-hmm. besides the first world countries, especially in the third world countries, especially in communist countries where there are underground churches and where Christians are being martyred or beheaded or, you know, whatever the case may be, there is an understanding of real intense persecution. And while there still may be injustices in the U.S. against Christians or against people of color or whatever, I just want to make the point that Christians as a whole, historically, are not strangers to persecution. They're not strangers to hegemonic power. They're not strangers to the society around them rejecting them. And and it's funny you mentioned that verse earlier that people can take out of context. Jesus right. said that I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword, mm-hmm. you know, and to bring war and to bring it between, you know, father and son, mother and daughter, blah, blah, blah. And the point of that statement was that was that Jesus Christ was the bridge to bring peace between God and man. But by bringing that peace, he created a conflict amongst his the, the people that would become Christians and the rest of the world. And right. so, you know, families would be split. Fathers would hate sons. Daughters would hate mothers, so on and so on. And so yes. within context, that's that's what that's saying. Uh, and, and I think that's really true. Now, Neil Shenby, uh, uh, the Christian apologist we've been, uh, apologist we've been talking about, um, he he writes uh, on on hegemonic power on the contrast of Christianity. He says that God has told the true story about uh, you know of reality. Uh, that means there is one true story of religion, one true story of morality, one true story of sexuality, one true story of gender, and so forth. And that while Christians can and should celebrate the diversity that God has created with respect to non-moral issues like food, music, styles, dresses, and so forth, there are certain things that Christians cannot embrace. We cannot embrace, for instance, diversity for diversity's sake. 
uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Christians can celebrate a diversity of views with respect to the deity of Christ, for instance, you know, or the sanctity of human life. You know, if, if you take a different view uh, of the deity of Christ, then you know what you're going to be called? You're going to be called, uh, uh, what was the word? Uh, heretic. <laughs> heretic. Heretic. Her heretic. Sorry, that's right. Yeah. In, in regards to human life, what's, what's the only other option, you know, besides thinking that, it, that human life is, um, you know, there, there's a, a, a that there is a sanctity to human life. What's the other option? The world that is, there's no sanctity. You, you know, he's just an animal, uh, a wild animal, and he can do as he pleases, right? No order. Um, so, Neil Shambi ends his, his uh, you know, note on hegemonic power saying that in the final analysis, and this is, I'm quoting him now, in the final analysis, there's only one true story of reality and only one valid set of moral values. And those are, God. From the perspective of critical race theory, this idea is completely unacceptable. <laughs> and therefore, and this uh, I say to the audience, that is why the uh, critical race theory as a worldview is, and here it goes, incompatible with Christianity. And that's where we come in and with the dangers and why we want to do all of this and go through all this trouble on this topic. Because if you're a Christian out there and you care about the word of God and you care about society, even if you don't care about the word of God, because there have been uh, non-Christians affected by this issue there. there I remember hearing some podcast of, of atheist uh, um, uh, professors and, and so forth talking against critical race theory because it's, it's hitting everyone uh, alike. And, and if, if you care about society in general, this is not a healthy view. Yeah, it, it, you kind of touched on this a second ago, but uh, with what Neil Shenvey said about that there is only God's moral truth, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, it, that is a direct conflict with what critical race theory would say. So that mm -hmm. I have my own experiences. They are ones that you can't have understood because you haven't experienced them the way I have. And so I have access to this truth that you don't understand, which means it's my truth. And mm -hmm. that flies in the face of the traditional concept of objective uh, truth. And yeah, that's just one way that it's incompatible with Christianity. Right. Very true. Uh, and then as we move along on the issue of oppression, you know, how we talked on the previous episode, how oppression it is, how it is defined, that it, how they define it. And basically, if you are just part of this class or group or, or color or skin, you're already the oppressed one or the oppressor. And what a contrast with what Christianity says. You know, I have a few scriptures here. Deuteronomy 10 says, for the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He excuses justice. Uh, he executes, sorry. <laughs> he executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the stranger by giving him food and clothing. So your love for the stranger. So show and this is what I'm saying. This is not part of the scripture. Show your love for the stranger. Uh, and, and scripture says, um, show it because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So in one way, we are all strangers to the situations and, and, the, and the problems that someone else faces. I'm stranger to your personal problems. You're a stranger to mine. Yet we're called to have compassion on that, to take a look, you know, to, to give a, a shoulder, to help you out, uh, each other out. And this is what it's called to on the unity whenever it comes to race issues in, in, in the country and in the world. We are supposed to be there. And this is the point where critical race theory, as I was mentioning, it prides on the Christian because we are called, it's our duty to go help the needy. And when they say, well, this guy is needy and you're not helping him and that's where they got you well they're you know like we were talking about they're they're changing the concepts of needy uh for the purpose of getting you to do what they want and uh 
So as we move along, let's see what else I had here. So duties, you know, we have uh, our duties. You know, Mark 12 talks about, um, well, there, I'll just read the scripture. Uh, it says, one of the scribes came up and heard them arguing and recognizing that he had answered them all uh, and asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? Uh, and Jesus answered, the foremost is, hear, Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than this. So there is our duty. You know, in two basic commandments that pretty much lay the foundation for the many principles that we go about as Christians. Loving our neighbors as ourselves but also taking into account that uh, we, that God is the top priority. He, we, our heart needs to be centered on him. If we want to first, you know, love ourselves so that, you know, our, uh, we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. That's the, the, the greatest commandment. You know, that's what, what Jesus said, uh, mm -hmm. which ironically wasn't a commandment until he said it. Uh, it was the summation of all the commandments. But yes. uh, aside mm -hmm. from that, he also he gives us this, uh, you know, the commission to to go out into the world and preach the gospel and uh, to spread the good news. Basically, there's this sense of uh, I have closed the gap for you. I have bridged the gap for you by offering myself as a sacrifice. And in, in response and out of love for me, you uh, go tell other people about that so that they might find this same new life, essentially. And, and there's, there's a redemptive portion to it, and there's a, uh, uh, a new life, essentially. There is, there's finding life and meaning beyond a person's mistakes. And mm -hmm. maybe this touches a little bit too much on uh, cancel culture and not critical race theory specifically, or mm -hmm. critical theory. But within critical race theory is a sense of hopelessness amongst a person who is in the oppressor group but doesn't want to be. Or they want to do good. They want to be to make up for their mistakes. And Critical race theory would say, well, your duties, the only way that you can get out of this is by being active and uh, raising up uh, individuals that are oppressed. But that work never ends, and it's never enough. And I kind of spoke about that earlier, and I, and I guess it's not a, uh, an argument one way or another, but just to show the dichotomy that there is a difference and a and a and opposites between Christianity and critical race theory. So mm -hmm. that Christ has said, "I've done the work for you. It's not something you could have done, and I bridged that gap. I forgave you your mm -hmm. trespasses." It doesn't say that your trespasses never happened, and it doesn't say that you could do anything to fix them. It's saying, I forgave them. You've, you've offended me on a cosmic level, and I've forgiven you. And that kind of love would go a whole long way uh, if that were to be applied to the, the issue of race. If the, you know, I've been accused, uh, uh, I, I guess, of being racist simply because my predecessors were. You know, if you go back to the 1800s or before mm -hmm. that, and it's like I I could not figure out why I was being uh, blamed for the sins of my fathers. You know, when it's like I didn't have any willpower to uh, to do that or not do that. And if um, people who are proposing critical race theory were to take the unconditional forgiveness that that Christ has expressed to us 
and express it to others around them. I think that would do a lot more to heal than this activism thing. C.S. Lewis said, you should forgive the unforgivable in others because Christ forgave the unforgivable in you. Hmm. Okay, so um, the last thing I was going to say then, you know, our identity in Christ, uh, how we identify as Christians. We, you know, we use the word a lot, Christ-like. We want to be Christ-like. And for that, well, you we have to read scripture. What is what did you know, Jesus do? Uh, how what messages the 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 God gave to His people? Uh, which way we are supposed to behave and and so forth? And um, the the contrast here with 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 you know the duties and the identity and the issue with oppression. Um, and I I think what the main contrast with critical race theory and Christianity is that scripture or, or Christianity mentions who is, the, the people who, who are struggling, who are hurt, uh, who are needing help, who cry out to him. Uh, these people are not necessarily uh, having these problems uh, because just because of their color or their status or gender or age, but because there is a much more profound evil uh, in the world, which makes people, uh, and, and here's the problem, people makes people, the, the some views that people hold uh, susceptible to hurt them or make them struggle or uh, uh, based on the color, status, gender, or age. And, 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 and I think that's the contrast with critical race theory as a summary here, that uh, what they're trying to say is just because you have this color, status, gender, or age, then you are oppressed. You have these duties and you have this identity. Whereas Christianity says anyone, regardless of color, status, gender, or age, will probably be struggling, being hurt, and needing help. And we are to give it to them. We're to, to help them and not yeah, be yeah. framing back. Um, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I was just going to say that, uh, and we kind of touched on this in a previous conversation, but mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of on-the-surface kind of statements that Christianity can agree with, with yes. critical race theory, but the devil's in the details. Like, it's, it's how you go about achieving that goal that determines whether or not it's a morally good thing to do. You've mm -hmm. already determined that the goal itself is morally okay or morally good, just, you know, right. Um, but the the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? <laughs> yes. Very true. Well, um, as we move along, there was one thing I wanted to mention, uh, not necessarily in regards to the contrast with Christianity, but for people in our audience, who anyone who's listening to this. So the way we have covered this conversation, this dialogue, has been the the Christianity, what what we what we claim, what we hold, and what critical race theory holds. But what happens if you're not a Christian and you're listening to this? What what can you get out of this conversation? Well, what I was gonna say is that we already cover a whole section of what just critical race theory, you know, shows and how it portrays uh, this issue of race. And uh, I don't think that you have to be a Christian in order to, to at least understand and side with some of the things we have said. Now, I will encourage you, uh, if you are listening and you're not a Christian, uh, how about you become a Christian? Look at all the amazing things we analyze that. Christianity offers that, that, that it has the message that it has for, let's say, issues with race. So if you're not a Christian, I commend you, uh, not command you, I commend you or encourage you, I should <laughs> say. <laughs> I encourage you to, to consider uh, this worldview, the Christian worldview, the truth that it has, you know, do some research, dedicate some time. Perhaps it is something that further advances the, the equality you seek in the workplace or anywhere else. 
uh, the the perhaps it gives you the the right tools to deal with oppression wherever you are, um, and and rather than the ones uh, critical race theory that I used to provide to you. So that's all I wanted to say about that. Do uh, you have anything else on that portion, uh, Edison? I, I would just say, and maybe it, it's kind of echoing what you said, but mm -hmm. uh, examine the way that the worldview of Christianity uh, addresses the problem of racism versus how does critical race theory address the problem of racism. And I'm not saying solely by this podcast, although I do hope we did it justice, but to do one's own research, to read mm -hmm. the Bible, uh, and determine what does God say about interactions with my neighbor, regardless, you know, whether or not they're a person of color, and and make the choice of what worldview what worldview you would subscribe to based on that uh to, to to think for oneself essentially that's right all righty so let's move to our last section of this uh, uh podcast series on critical race theory let's talk about uh objections you know to the things that we have said um i'm i'm not sure if you have anything uh, already written or planned on on this section edison but uh i did look into possible things that has been said or had I, that I have heard um, that would try to invalidate our, you know, contrast with critical race theory. For instance, um, there is, uh, you know, there is the issue of slavery in the Old Testament, you know, and, and, and I, I sort of uh, make an argument uh, if, if I were to play devil's advocate. Uh, something along this line. If scripture can condone such an evil as slavery, then it can also condone racism. Uh, and then the second premise would be, well, scripture does condone slavery. It's in the Old Testament. And then the conclusion would be that therefore, therefore it can condone racism. And I was thinking about that because it, it, people doesn't, you know, formalize their, their argument or what they're saying that way. But a lot of times they will go, "Well, what about the the you know the Canaanites? What about the 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 all the people, the Amorites? That you know, God just wiped them out. You know, you think that's nice of God? Do you think Christianity really offers you uh, a good, um, you know, uh, fluffy feeling inside about?" You know, oppression. <laughs> Look at all these issues that are in the Old Testament. Uh, and, and I thought about that. And um, just the argument that I presented for, for right now, I think that uh, this is so misleading uh, on both premises. For instance, the first one, that, that if Scripture condone such an evil as slavery, then it can condone racism. So the first thing I think to note on that is that um, uh, even assuming that scripture does condone slavery, it does not mean it condone racism, you know, uh, as we understand it today. Uh, and what I mean by this is that the, 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 the connection doesn't follow. Maybe, maybe scripture does, you know, endor and endorses something that we consider evil today, but that doesn't mean it, it endorses something else that is evil too, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so just on that count uh, alone, it's it, it's I think it, the the premise is false. But why stop there, right? So uh, the 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 second thing that I want to note is that you know the second premise says scripture does condone slavery. Now, I don't I I don't think that's uh, right. So let, let's start out with one example. The the slavery of of uh, slavery slave time of Israel in Egypt, you know, God um, punished Pharaoh and its people for that, and it and it and it took Israel out of there, out of slavery into a new land. Now, of course, the response is, well, took them to a land that wasn't theirs, 
and it conquer a bunch of people, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so so just because God, uh, you know, told you so. And um, <laughs> so there is a lot of counter examples back and forth that can be done on, on that conversation. But one thing that I wanted to say is that, um, you know, that the very idea that scripture condones slavery, it's something that it's it's uh, it can be very misleading because, it, you, you know, there is this author called uh, Paul, Paul Copin, and there is uh, uh, he has a book called it is God a Moral Monster? And I would recommend people to read that book. There are many interpretations as to uh, the language used on scripture. And, and, as, and for those who are listening uh, on this podcast who may not be believers, or even if you are, but scripture, you know, the Bible, is it's a, it's a collection of books of, of several different authors. It's not just the one book that was written by one author. And therefore, it, each book and each author has its own style of writing, its own audience, its own context. And what uh, perhaps what is understood as slavery, uh, Paul Copan writes in his book, in the in the time of of the of the Canaanites, uh, sorry, in the time of, uh, uh, of 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 the conquering, yeah, of the Promised Land, uh, it's not the same type of of slavery that people have in mind here from you know that came from from Europe in the times of William Wilberforce or 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 even the the type of discrimination that we see today on uh, um, uh, or not not necessarily today but we 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 see there in the civil rights movement and uh, uh, that is a very important to note because so okay so what does the scripture say about slavery and uh, some of the things that are talked about on the book are like well perhaps it's in, intended servitude uh, people may not agree with that but it is it is a defensible view of what the concept actually meant back there uh, a very much simple example is the word that we used to do uh, you know words change over time the word gay right before it used to just mean happy person nowadays we um it seems to be associated with homosexuality. And uh, in the same way, the word slavery back then, uh, it doesn't mean the same thing. So we have to be very careful with context. And for that, it goes back to the same message that we said on our first episode. We have to be prepared to be able to give a defense for uh, the reason for the hope that we have within. And, and that is an important thing. Uh, but I just want to say that there is more than meets the eye. That's what the message I want you to, to take home. There is more than meets the eye. And there is a lot uh, that goes in, in line with, with this issue. So don't take it for granted that, oh, well, Scripture condones slavery. Well, hey, wait a minute. Let's talk about that then. Let, don't let them take your peace because of a word. Do a little research, it will save you a lot of headaches, and it will also make you a stronger or more informed Christian. And and did you have any uh, anything else that could work as an objection? I have questions, not necessarily objections. They're not formal objections. So does critical race theory work in other places in the world where those who would be the minority groups in the USA are instead the majority groups? So, for instance, uh, are we still, uh, are, are people that proposed critical race theory, are they going to endorse a person who, like, for instance, my sixth grade teacher was a white woman born and raised in South Africa? And uh, that because her parents were missionaries. Now, she's the minority there, uh, and especially in the area she grew up in. And does that mean that if she were to become a, uh, an endorser of critical race theory, would she be able to say, I'm oppressed, and you're, you know, to the S South African government, you know, you're... Mm -hmm. uh, exercising hegemonic power against me or blah 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 uh am i morally i guess 
do I need to go fight for her uh, mm-hmm. to become a not oppressed person? Because I have a sneaking suspicion that for some people, whether or not this is true for many or all, some people that are part of the movement for CRT dislike white people. And I know that would hate uh, that does not come across right. That that's not a politically correct thing to say. Um, and if I even mention reverse racism, someone's going to flip their, I don't know, you know, they're <laughs> going to flip out. Right. Um, I just want people to think about, is this a, uh, is this a worldview or a concept that works if you change the variables? Uh, or is this just uh, something that uh, would, I guess, is part of a fad? So uh, on one point, um, we could say that oppression can be on the axis of religion, right? Uh, mm-hmm. A person can be oppressed because they're a part of uh, a particular religion. Um, mm-hmm. My question is, Despite the claim that oppression or social justice, social injustice, can be based on religion, our gender, or blah, 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 critical race theory still claims that Christianity is itself a massive form of oppression. Mm -hmm. They are tolerant of religion until it's Christianity. And that's really funny to me because, at least from what I have studied and read so far, Islam can be a whole lot harder on women and homosexuals and uh uh yeah but than than Christianity is it it sounds as if uh, the the what, what you're saying the way I'm uh, correct me if I'm wrong but perhaps the 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 framing of the of your question it's like if I am part of an oppressed group truly that you would consider an oppressed group, but it just happens to be that that oppressed group is also an oppressor group according to your own claims and tenets. So where does that leave me? Right, right. Or how do you justify that? Right. Wow. Yeah. Very good question for them. <laughs> and then my very my very last question mm-hmm. is is basically imagine in your head that – uh, critical race theory works, and that uh, we shift the balance of power from where uh, you know white cisgender males in political positions with lots of money and are are successful. Blah blah blah. They are lowered, and uh, people of color are raised up into their positions of power, and basically the scale is flipped the scale is reversed so now i my question is does critical race theory still apply and now does are the people that are oppressed are they the white cisgender males you know instead of being the oppressors because now they're uh like do the scales flip and then do do is it this um never ending cycle of fighting for uh, uh, equality or or to fighting to raise up the oppressed groups and ending up only in imbalancing it in the opposite direction. Um, and mm. I, I don't know. I kind I kind of got on that earlier too. So uh, I'm not sure that came out very well. But so that that's late. that would be if I'm not mistaken the way you're, you're framing it is. This would be someone who is part of an oppressed group, according to the definitions of critical race theory, and somehow advances out of it. Would that person become then oppressor immediately, regardless of all the other attributes that still tied it to uh, critical race theory? Did I right. say that right? So, okay. Yeah, so like... Uh... All of the all of the things that make someone an oppressed person, their mm-hmm. race and their gender and their sexual orientation and their uh, 
whether or not they're able or their age or whatever. You know, if they're uh, all the you know the sudden they they become um, wealthy and successful, and uh, everyone around them is also you know uh, a homosexual, so that that's no longer a minority group. Uh, mm-hmm. And what if they're also uh, uh, everyone's the same age and everyone's the same level of being able-bodied or not? Now, the person that was taken down from that level, what if they become the minority? Right. Does critical race theory then still apply? If 100 or 200 years in the future, if everything's flipped from what it is now, Will our descendants who, if critical race theory works, are they going to be fighting for the freedom of or, or the, you know, to advance the position of the oppressed cis white gen, you know, cisgendered white males who are, you know, uh, whatever. I'm just, uh, can you interchange the variables and does the, does it still work? Or is this a, or is this a system or a uh, worldview that is already predisposed to a certain group? I guess that's wow. what I'm asking. Yeah, very good questions, Addison. I think that would be how we end this uh, this series podcast and uh, as with food for thought for our audience. Um, I want to say, if you want to read more, uh, learn more about critical race theory and from and, and the and the contrast with Christianity, like we said, we mentioned the apologist uh, or Christian apologist uh, Neil Shenvey, and uh, you basically can go to Google and type Neil Shenvey critical theory or critical race theory, and you you will see everything, everything that we're seeing, uh, we're reading there. Um, also. Uh, really briefly, like a word bank, uh, we've we've said a lot about Christian apologists and apologetics and so forth. And uh, uh, I would I would point people to my message uh, on Life Church uh, regarding this ministry, what we stand, uh, what is it all about. Uh, and in there, I also mention what is an apologist and basically just someone who is defending the faith. Uh, but so you can, uh, I'm pointing you to the message of the introduction to the ministry. Uh, you can find it at Life Church, uh, St. Peter's uh, uh, website. And um, there's many other messages from uh, many other speakers. And I hope that you can find, um, you know, what you're looking for <laughs> in, in, in all of this. I also hope that this uh, podcast, you know, helps you. In, in some way to think um, critically about the issues that surround us, uh, and especially critical race theory, at least for this podcast. Addison, thank you very much for all your contribution, and thanks everyone who has added to this ministry to make this podcast possible as well. Thank you so much, and uh, uh, I just wanna close out for everyone and with our or what could be called the Christian apologetics, uh, Christian verse, uh, very important for any any conversation that we engage in, and it is in First Peter three fifteen. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Hello, thank you for listening to Reasons for the Hope podcast. If you would like to learn more about us, you can find us on Facebook under Reasons for the Hope, RFTH.